go and there we go all right so we'll just wait we're just going to wait a few minutes here So we'll probably get started in just a few minutes here. Oh, since Twitch is delayed, should we listen through that instead? It's up to you. I would say if you want to listen through that, like the best way to do it would just be to listen through that and uh, ask questions in Twitch chat. But I know not everyone has, not everyone uh, wants to do it that way. So it's up to you. Like maybe some people are in a place where they can't watch Twitch, but they can join Mumble on their phone or something like that, you know, so. Understood. So there will be no practical section of this class as it's kind of, um, it's not really something that showing practically makes a difference in uh it's better to see it in like an actual fight and i can't just magically make one of those happen so um but this will hopefully arm you with some knowledge as to what each e word does uh what it's good for and what it's bad for and um and how to use pypha to kind of see what effect it's going to have Thank you for the sub, Jeremy. Four months. One of the first few. <clears throat> All right. So any um, questions before we start not to do with the material? Lost, thanks, buddy. Multi-dollar empire height. This man is an instrument. Matt and Mort, thank you very much. Sorry, what? Never mind. Okay. Thank you guys for the subs. Much appreciated. All right. So uh, the first thing we will do, Alcantar, thank you for the sub as well, my friend, is uh, I just want to show everyone, and you can watch this on the stream as well, um, how you would basically look for uh, a fit in game and get it into Pypha. So the number one way to look for fits easily is just to check court fittings. So you would open your fitting window. You would click on the little, uh, make sure you're selected on the little gear on the left, to the left of the ship. Uh, and then there's two boxes to the top that show personal fittings and corporation fittings. Make sure that court fittings is selected. And then you can just browse through. But the easiest thing to do if you know what you're looking for is just to put the type of ship in the search thing at the top. So the first ship we're going to look at is the Mollus. So we go in here and we see the little star next to it means it's a corp fitting. We click on it. I'm going to load it up in the little ship simulator. And then down at the bottom of the fitting window, there's an import and export button. And you just click on that and choose copy to clipboard. Once you do that, you get Pypha opened. 
and then you just control V and it will import it as a new fit. It'll set it up at uh, the top right of the Python window. You have a character dropdown. You can set, set it to no skills, all skills, or any of the characters that you've made. Uh, if you open that dropdown and choose open character editor, that's where you can uh, click the buttons at the top to create a new character. And once you've created a character, like say with your name, then you can go to, you can either manually set your skills, which is obnoxious uh, and won't update automatically, or you can just click the API tab, put in your info there. Well, I shouldn't, that, I don't know why that's on stream, but I have to delete that API now. Oh wait, no, it's not. Sick. It doesn't capture this window. That's good. Um, but that's how you load a character in. And there are guides for that as well. <clears throat> so once you have your character in, I don't know why this all fives thing is showing a, showing a star. Normally it shows a star when there's like some skill that's not set to what it should have been. In any case, that's fine. <clears throat> so you see, once you get your fit into Pypha, it shows all the statistics for the modules, it shows the fittings, it shows, or rather how much it takes to fit, it shows, um, it has a, a column that shows capacitor usage, it has a column that shows optimal range and fall off, it has a, a column that will show various information for EWR modules, it's the effectiveness of the of the uh, module as it's currently set up and if you mouse over these things you can't see it on stream because pypha is shit at actually capturing um but it will if you mouse over the percent uh, it will show you for instance in the mollus when you hover over it it says lock range and scan resolution dampening <clears throat> and then if you have it turned on uh, the last column it will show the cost of the stuff so we can look at the uh, mollus first because that's a sensor dampener ship. Sensor dampeners will reduce the targeting range and scan resolution of any ship that you activate it on. You can choose it to uh, apply equally to both of those statistics, or you can load it with a script to make it do twice as much, but only to one. So in a lot of situations, we'll end up using uh, targeting range as kind of your default. So if you right click the module and go to charge and uh, choose, it'll show you the two types of scripts that you can use. And we choose targeting range dampening script. You can see the percent in the effectiveness column changes uh, to, like I said, twice as much as it was. And so that'll show you just on a basic level, you know, the, the stats of the ship. So the thing that gets more interesting is when you want to <clears throat> when you want to uh, show or see the actual effect this would have on a ship. Uh, so what you can do is you can take any fitting that you have in Pypha. So I'll just bring up, um, let's just say a Ferox, one of our standard Feroxes. So this is the standard Ferox fit. Uh, and you can see the stats down here uh, on the bottom right. Uh, that are basically what we can affect with the mollus, which is the targeting range and the scan resolution. And the way that you see, you know, the effectiveness of the mollus onto the Sphérox, for example, is to choose the projected tab at the bottom of whatever, fit, whatever ship you're trying to affect. You click the projected tab at the bottom. And then it will say drag an item or fit or use the right click menu for wormhole effects. So you can just drag items on here, but the best thing to do actually is to then go into your fittings, uh, get the fit that you that you just brought in. So it's our MBI e wormolus here, and we'll drag it down. We'll drag and drop it into that projected area. And you can see now this Ferox is being affected by the modules on the mollus. So if we check its range, targeting range is now 19.1 kilometers. And we can actually, while this is still set up, we can actually go back to our MBI e Mollus fit, and we can change these charges to scan resolution dampening scripts instead. And without doing anything else, we can go straight back to this Ferox, 
and we'll see the targeting range is back up to where it was before, but the scan resolution is now being completely murdered. So that's basically how you can check, you know, how effective is my one ship um, or my EWAR against any particular ship. You can even, like I said, since it's uh, since it just sort of constantly pulls and updates based on the fit that you're uh, that you drag into that projected window, you can say like, okay, well, with all three damps on, it's you know 19.1 kilometers targeting. But what if I just used one? So you can actually offline these modules and just leave one dampener on the mollus online and go back to the ferox and you can see, okay, with just one, it reduces it from, what was it, 93 to 47. Um, and, you know, it will calculate stacking penalties for having multiple E-War on the same ship, uh, targeting onto the same ship, and it will do all that calculation for you. Uh, so that's sort of how to how to use Pypha in terms of getting the the getting your fits in and seeing how they affect other ships. That's sort of how you can test out you know like um, if you're wondering like all right how effective is my ship versus this ship? That's the way you can test it, and it will take into account your skills and everything else. If you change the character here, like if I change this to uh, a Galente Alpha clone, which I have set up here. Um, it doesn't come set up by default, but you know this is just an example of a different character with different skills. You can see we go back to the Ferox, and it's 58 kilometers, so not quite the 47 of a max skilled character, um, but it takes all of that into account. Does anyone have any questions about that stuff? Uh, someone asked, is there is Pypha just a better layout than in-game? It just gives you more options uh, and more ways to test things more easily, I feel, than the in-game does. Um, the in-game ship simulator thingy is way better than what we used to have, but I still think the um, Pypha or EFT, if you, EFT has almost all the same options as Pypha does, um, but I think the out-of-game fitting tools are still uh, more flexible and easier to use. Can you import a fit from Corp Fits? Uh, yeah, that's what I did at the very beginning of the video. So if you missed it, just check the check the beginning of the video once it gets uh, posted, and you'll see. It's just a, a simple selecting the Corp Fit, exporting or copying into the clipboard, and then pasting it in, into uh, Pypha. So the what version of Pypha did I download? Hold on. Uh, I'll get the link to Pypha. So if you just go there, and I always just download whatever the newest one is, uh, the .exe file. Um, if your antivirus is flagging it, it's probably a false positive, because uh, I highly doubt that there's viruses in Pypha. Um, so the main uses for damps, uh, obviously we know what the we know what sensor dampeners do, right? We've we've learned that by looking at the the module. You can even you know right click in here or in game or whatever and uh, and see it, it will say pretty clearly what it does. It reduces the range and speed of a targeted chip sensors, um, and then under attributes it has a whole bunch of nonsense, but uh, it, this is where it will show you know what the uh, maximum targeting range bonus and then scan resolution bonus and uh, so those those two things are are mainly used um, you know scan resolution is mainly used on logistics enemy logistics because it will sort of delay the time between when a when someone broadcasts for repairs and when the logistics finishes locking them up as a target to send the repairs you can also use it on enemy damage ships uh, in certain situations, it's it's generally better to 
use that in a situation where it's going to push something to an extreme. So let's say that the enemy has battleships and you're in smaller ships, so they're already going to be taking quite a while to lock you. You know, using uh, scan resolution dampeners on those ships pushes you know that weakness further to the extreme. Um, you know, whereas let's say, you know, if you're in cruisers and they're in battleships and you're up close to them, uh, you know, a battleship has a very long base targeting range. So using targeting range damps, if you're already fairly close to, to those battleships, is going to be somewhat ineffective compared to uh, using scan resolution on them, which is just going to make them take forever to lock you up. Decisions like that are usually made by the FC, but you can always ask. Uh, targeting range damps are generally used on um, on enemy DPS ships. You can use them on logistics. Uh, it's a there is you know you can use tactics like if the enemy logi is at range from their DPS, you can use targeting range scripts to damp them, force them to come closer, and then once they come close, you switch back over to scan resolution to make their lock time longer. And if they pull range again, you switch back and forth. Um, but usually targeting range damps end up being used on enemy DPS ships. So like we saw with the Ferox earlier, um, especially Tech 1 ships, you can really, really cripple their targeting range um, with damps. Uh, especially if they're a ship that, um, like a really good example would be the Caracal. We can pull that fit up here. So if we have a, uh, a hmm. let's get rid of that. If we have a basic Horde T2 character with no links, the targeting range is 89.8 kilometers uh, at all, all five skills, and the missile range is 83.7 kilometers at all five skills. So you can see that the targeting range is actually just barely outside of the missile range. If we were to apply this mollus, to the caracal, and remember our mollus right now uh, only has one active dampener, so this is just one. You would have three, so you could spread you know one each onto three caracals, or you could you know double or triple them up. But even with just one one targeting range damp. Uh, and this is even just an alpha, right? So this is just alpha skills in a mollus with one damp reduces the Caracal's targeting range to 56 kilometers, which means effectively their missile range, or their you know their their weapon range is also reduced to 56 kilometers. Now let's say you turn on all three. Now the Caracal can only target out to 29.5 kilometers, which again means their effective missile range goes down to 29.5 kilometers. And if you're a maxed out character, they're down to 18.3 kilometers. So you can see that one, you know, not even a million isk ship right? 700,000 isk ship can completely remove an enemy caracal from the fight, essentially. Uh, especially if their anchor isn't aware of, you know, whatever people, whatever e-wars are happening to them, then they may not be pulling in close. <clears throat> so if the fleet is still at range, this caracal who's being damped is basically not able to do anything. You, you've essentially removed him from the fight uh, as just a single e-war frigate. Now, if you spread your dampeners over a bunch of them, and you know there's a bunch of E-War dudes all spreading dampeners over a bunch of them, you're you know taking a lot of them out of the fight. Uh, and if they come close, you know generally speaking, in a lot of situations, the closer something that wants to stay at range, like the Kaidi sort of Caracal stuff, or even the Feroxes in a lot of cases, the closer you can force them, the better off you are, because um, that allows you to apply your damage better. So does anyone have any questions on sensor damps uh, or anything else that we talked about so far?
Yes. Sure, go ahead. Uh, if, if you're damping somebody that's actively targeting somebody else, does the lock speed hit them while they're targeting, or is it only before they target? I believe if they're in the middle of targeting someone, it will recalculate for the remaining ticks of the lock. Thanks. So, like, if they're if it takes them ten seconds to lock them up, and then you damp their scan resolution during the middle of that, I think for whatever time period they have left on the lock, it will recalculate the speed at which the remaining portion will happen. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? to the class from getting off work i'm just wondering will this be posted online anywhere for me to view it at a later time yep yeah i'll have it on my youtube channel as well as it'll be uh, in my twitch vods so okay great thanks mm -hmm. all right so um one thing to note about the mollus in particular is that the other e-war and i'm speaking um in a in a fairly specific sense, you know, you can you can put things like uh, tackle modules under E War as well, but I'm talking about um, you know the the sort of commonly used definition of E War. The other forms tend to be reliant on there being certain conditions. Excuse me. <clears throat> uh, in terms of the fight, like. Um, for instance, uh, the crucifier, which we'll go over next, you have to choose, do you want to be effective versus missile ships or versus gunships? Um, the, uh, you know, target painters only really matter if the increase in the enemy's signature is worthwhile to your fleet or not. It's in a lot of cases, it doesn't make a difference. Um, sensor dampeners will always be useful. Uh, at a very basic level, reducing the lock time of enemy DPS ships will delay their damage. Reducing the targeting range of enemy DPS ships will control range. Um, you know, it, it only grows from there in terms of utility. If the enemy are using logistics, you can mess with them. If the enemy are using a composition um, where certain single ships are very important to those compositions you can target that ship specifically to you know essentially reduce the effectiveness of a force multiplier in the enemy fleet um, there's basically there's very few fleets uh that there's there's no fleet actually where sensor dampeners won't do anything unless it's enemy capitals that are like sieged or whatever and and have 100 percent e-war resistance Uh, someone in Twitch chat asked, are E-War frigs worth the cost considering the bonuses compared to T-1 frigs? Yeah, you're talking about the EAFs, electronic uh, attack frigates or electronic attack ships. Um, they can be, but you have to be more careful with them because they, you know, in the way that you would probably want to fit those ships, they generally won't have much, if any, tank, but they're worth, like, many magnitudes more ISK. Um, so... It depends. I would say definitely get good at fighting in an E-War frigate without getting completely annihilated using T1 ships first, and once you feel comfortable, then you can try T2. Um, so I think that's pretty much everything I have to say about sensor damps and the mollus. Uh, the Celestis is the cruiser class of uh, remote sensor dampener ship. Um, it's pretty decent, um, but it's, uh, you know, being not a frigate, it's harder to just, like, be annoying and run away and so on. Um, so you have to kind of choose more carefully when you when you bring an E-War cruiser into a fight. Um, they're, you know, because E-War is a mid-slot module, tends to be easier and better to put an armor tank on any warship. Um, so you want to consider if you're, you know, in an armor fleet or not, um, and whether, you know, how tanky you are and so on. And always just ask the FC as far as what they want. Anyone have any questions before we move on?
All right. So let's go to the, what I think is the next best and probably the most effective e war frigate um, in the game at what it does, which is the crucifier. Uh, so let's just close this out. Make sure you always clear this stuff, guys. Just make sure no links. I'll clear this out. No links here. No links here. Okay. Hmm. My my crucifier fit I have in Pipa is missing rigs for some reason. So I'll go back into the game. I'll go to corp fittings. Uh, I don't know about the, the drone thingies. Probably, usually sentry drones aren't as good for PvE than regulars. So we'll go in here, we'll take this MBI, we'll select it, and we'll go down to import, export, copy to clipboard. Go back to Python, and we'll paste it in. So. What you have on the crucifier are weapon disruptors. There used to just be, they used to just be tracking disruptors, but now there's also missile guidance disruptors as well. And we can take a look at both of those today. So the crucifier I feel is the strongest E-War frigate because of the range that it can work with. Um, you can see here on a max skill character that the tracking disruptors uh, work out to 155 kilometers optimal and the ship can actually target out to 145 so you can be really far away and still have full effectiveness and let's say you're an alpha your skills aren't going to be quite as good but even on an alpha character you're talking 100 kilometer optimal uh, and you can still target out to quite a distance this is without links or anything so this is just like what you would actually get in game on a regular basis um, but let's say that you're maxed out skills just for the sake of consistency. So, uh, you know, if we want to test how this thing works against enemies, we can do just what we did before. Um, but the results of which are a little bit harder to see. But I can go over exactly how uh, how you can test this, right? It's, it's not the simplest thing, but the functionality in Pypha is there. And I think it's important to... Uh, to understand how to use it so first we want to uh, script our disruptors so we use tracking disruptors here first we'll right click on them and choose charge or charge all to change them all at once and let's do optimal range disruption script so we know we're reducing the optimal range of the enemy's turrets when we have this script loaded uh, and you can see in the little effects column on Pytha it shows the percent for each uh, it reduces the fall off and the optimal range. Uh, and so then we just go over, let's say, our Ferox. And we see the Ferox by default is going to have 122 kilometer optimal plus 18.8 .8 kilometer fall off with spike ammo loaded. And if we take our little crucifier here that we just worked on and we drag it over to projected, boom. A single crucifier. This is a single crucifier which can operate at a hundred, like 150 kilometers, reduces a and costs what, you know, 700,000 esk, reduces a Ferox's optimal range to essentially nothing. 18 kilometers with spike. If they were to switch to antimatter they have a five kilometer optimal. You essentially turn their railguns into blasters. They're, they're, they're basically useless until you die or until they force you off field or whatnot. Even if you were to, let's go to alpha skills. So this is like simulated low skills. And let's say you only put one disruptor on them. Okay. Even then, if we go to spike, you're reducing their range from 122 kilometer optimal to 70 kilometers. 
Um, and no matter what ammo they switch to, they're always going to have a shorter range than they did before. So you can essentially, like say, our Feroxes are fighting enemy Feroxes and we're both, you know, out at 90 kilometers shooting spike at each other. You could essentially, in this Crucifier, take out three enemy Feroxes from that fight. One for each of these Disruptors. Sorry if you guys hear the dogs, they're doing dog stuff. Um... Uh, password wants me to show iron ammo, so we'll go to iron, and you can see it's even less, 62 kilometers with iron. So even just one disruptor from a low-skilled crucifier can really, really mess up a ship that's based on range. Um, that's sort of like, the Ferox is one of the better case scenarios for it. Um, but it absolutely shows. Uh, no, I haven't covered Kaldari yet. We're just on the second one here. So those are the reasons why um, I think the Crucifier is like the strongest, provided that it's in the proper situation. Um, the difference is that, you know, obviously tracking disruptors aren't going to do anything against uh, missile ships. Uh, someone asked, most of the fits don't come with weapons. Should we leave them off? Uh, in, in an E-War ship, you don't, your weapons are in your mid-slots. These E-War modules are your weapons, essentially. You don't do damage directly, but you affect the fight in a much more valuable way. So your your high slots can be empty. It's There's really no reason for you to have weapons fit on these ships. Um, so let's take a look at, while, we're on, while we have tracking disruptors fit, let's take a look at... Uh, tracking speed disruption script because these are a little bit harder to show in terms of like when you project onto a fit so let's do something where I know it's gonna be a real big difference we're gonna take a tempest fit here and we will just make sure we'll just turn these off and this okay so here's the standard tempest right and we'll give it uh, EMP and we can see in the in this uh, column with the little blue icon you know it's sort of the effects column this is where for turrets tracking would be listed but it doesn't really mean much when you just look at it right it says 1.84 tracking speed and you can compare compare that to um, angular velocity in game and and do and see if you can track or not or, what, or whatnot but it on a practical in the moment level it doesn't mean very much so when we go over to our crucifier and we drag it down into the projected no nope, not that one this one we can see the tracking numbers went down but that doesn't really tell us anything useful if you, especially if you're new to the game the numbers here don't like mean anything to you right so um, what you can do instead is you can show so we'll just toggle down in the in the projected when you have the ship listed that you've dragged there you can actually click on this checkbox turns it off you can actually see the numbers changing as you do that so we'll turn it off for a second so what we first have to do is show in some way um, how this Tempest would actually track something, theoretically. And the way that we do that is we go up to our window menu. It's at the, the top of the screen. You can't really see it on the thing because Pypha is really bad at capturing, but there's a, you know, the file menu at the top. Next to that, there's a drop-down called Window, and then you go to Graphs. You can also hit Control-G. Uh, let's put this here. So this opens up a graph, and essentially what this does is whatever fit you're selected on, it opens you up a graph based on that fit um, and everything that's currently running on that fit. Let's turn these off. So this opens us up and it shows essentially uh, what DPS that we theoretically apply to a target considering the variables that are in these four boxes. 
So I normally just like set the range out to like 200 and that will give us, you'll immediately see this line that comes down. Essentially, you're looking at optimal and then where the line starts to fall down is when you're into fall off. Um, but then here we can set the target angle. 90 degrees is the theoretical worst. Uh, that's basically it moving at a 90 degree angle or perpendicular to you. Uh, but the important part, and this is where you can figure out how well you're going to apply based on any given ship, is the signature radius and the velocity. So let's take the Ferox, for instance. Um, do, 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 do. So we'll turn the MWD off just to make the numbers a little smaller. So we switch over to our Ferox in the background here, and this is just to get some numbers, right? So we look down in the targeting section, and we want the speed and the signature radius. So the speed is 188 meters per second. We just type 188 there. And, oops, that's not the right one. 188 there in the velocity, and the signature radius is 389 meters, as listed right here. So 389. So this is where we can see the damage graph. This is against, you know, this ferox fit traveling perpendicular and with this signature radius uh, and this velocity. Or sorry, the, uh, the graph itself is based on the, the tempest fit and then these two numbers, the signature radius and the velocity is how we're telling it essentially. We're pulling, we're taking those numbers from this ferox fit. So what that does for us is generate a graph based on those Ferox numbers that we inputted in these two boxes. And the bottom uh, axis is range and the, the, uh, hor or the vertical axis is DPS. So at zero range, we do zero DPS because they're just so close we can't track anything. As they get further away, we start to be able to track more and more and more and more. The further away they are, uh, the easier we can track them because they're, they're sort of moving less degrees per second uh, across our field of view. And then we can see uh, what we saw before, which is this is like the fall off of the actual range of the weapons. So we can actually go to the weapons and we can change the ammo. I'm just going to change it to titanium sabo and you can see the graph changes. So we can track a little bit better in the sort of medium range because titanium sabo has a tracking bonus on it that ammo type does we can hit out to further before we start to lose damage due to fall off because the weapon or the uh, ammo has a longer uh, optimal range and the graph updates so now once we have figured out how to show you know our damage against any particular target based on the signature radius and the velocity then we can actually start to project effects, right? So we can check in, uh, let's say, let's say we're using EMP, right? Because that's uh, a lot of the time what we do. So switch back to EMP in our, in our Tempest. And we have this very, we have this very um, narrow but high damage area. Let's see what happens when we put optimal range scripts in our tracking computers on this Tempest and turn them on. You can see as our optimal and falloff increases, it sort of pushes the range at which we deal damage outwards. Um, so this is also like, say you're, say you're shooting against a target that's harder to track, Ferroxes are pretty easy to track. But if you're looking at like, okay, would I do more damage if um, I used optimal range scripts and moved further from the opponent? Because the further you are, the easier it is to track if everything else is equal. The further the enemy is away, the easier your guns will track them. And, you know, pushing your optimal and your fall off further away from you means that you can still deal optimal damage from further away, so your tracking will be a little bit better at that distance. Or is it better for me to put in tracking scripts, which will increase the tracking of my guns, excuse me, from a basic level, and this is the way that you can try to sort of mess with those numbers or see the effects of the change. So we can switch these to tracking speed scripts. And then we can see, okay, well, we do more damage. We have more potential damage at the 
at the point that we do the most of our damage, but we have a much more narrow range within which we can apply that damage. Um, so yeah, you can see those, you can see the difference. And then we can turn on our crucifier and it doesn't look like the graph changes too much, but pay attention to the numbers on the, on the vertical axis here because you'll actually see that they drop fairly precipitously. So the range, if we're applying tracking uh, disruption, like tracking speed disruption to somebody, the, the range that they can deal damage at uh, tends to stay the same or thereabouts, but their DPS all along that range will fall off because they'll just be tracking a little worse the entire time. Now, based on certain other bit factors, um, you know, these graphs will change in different ways depending on what kind of target you're shooting. Um, like, let's say you're shooting... Uh, let's say you're shooting an armor ship, right? Uh, let me find one. Let's do a guardian. I don't know what this guardian fit is. Um, sure, that seems like a normal guardian fit. We'll we'll put an afterburner on this because it's normally how they run. So if we want to see our Tempest's uh, damage against this Guardian or, or, you know, potential application against the Guardian, we'll go to the Guardian's numbers and we'll say, um, and we'll just, we're just going to run this all without links just so it's easier, but you can, you can drag, if you set up a, a fit for a link ship, you can also drag it down into this command tab like you do with the projected tab. Uh, so the stats here, 605. And the signature, so, oops, again, I'm doing it in the wrong order. So the signature is 70, which is a lot smaller, both because it's a cruiser and because it's an armor ship. And the speed is 605. So now you can see the Tempest does a maximum of 13 DPS at 160 kilometers versus this Guardian. Um... If we go here and we turn on the crucifier, it basically goes down to nothing. It like can't even apply 0 .00 or 0 0.01 DPS at almost any range. Um, so this is an example of, you know, a situation where the, um, you know, let's say guardians are at like, you know, moving at like 45. Um, or a 45 degree angle, you get a bit more DPS, but you apply the tracking. Uh, disruption and it just the DPS disappears completely uh, yeah you can make you can have multiple um, fits into the graph if you have two separate fits and apply things differently to both of them and get like get the graph to show both at once um, but that's, I don't know, I, I don't really do that too much, only because it's a little bit more work. Um, and it's, yeah, when you're like, I, it's like applying multiple multiple effects to multiple fits. Uh, it's a, it's a little, little too deep for what I normally end up using Pypha for. Um, but yeah, so that's pretty much, that's how tracking disruptors work. That's kind of the effects they have and how you can kind of uh, test the effects uh, on various ships. You can also, you know, project multiple things, you know, like let's say um, you're trying to, you're trying to figure out, okay, well, I know this is what, how we're applying, you know, let's say you're not doing an E-War thing. You're just saying like, how do, how are my Tempests going to apply to Guardians? And you're like, oh shit, they're basically not at all. You know, even if I go in here and I change my comp tracking computers to tracking speed scripts, um, I'm still doing like almost no DPS to these things. Um, and you would say, well, how would you, how would you, uh, how do we, how do we deal with that, right? In fleets, 
Uh, let me see. Do I have a web Loki saved? <clears throat> uh, yes, I do. So we can go to the Guardian here. <clears throat> yeah, we'll get to ECM. Chill, chill, chill. We'll get there. Uh, and we can basically go to our Guardian to, you know, because this is where we're pulling the speed and signature. We can go to its projected and drag our Loki into that. And provided that our Loki's webs are turned on, they are, and its target painter. So this is the effect of one Loki on the Guardian. You can see it slows it down considerably to 116. So we change the velocity to 116. And it blows the signature up a little bit because it's got a painter 96.3. And you can see, look at that, a single web Loki. If a guardian is in range of a web Loki and we get it webbed down and painted, we start to apply a lot of our DPS. Um, so yeah, that's how you can basically use the projected effects thing of Pypha to to test all sorts of all sorts of scenarios. Uh, so there's that. So does anyone have any questions about tracking disruption? We'll go over the missile disruption in just a moment. And we'll just wait a minute for Twitch chat to catch up. All right, I'm just going to look through, I'm just going to read back through Twitch chat real quick and make sure I didn't miss any questions or anything. Weapons. The skills, you were stuff. Okay, follow orders. You were all right. You guys are just helping out in the chat. All right, cool. Helpful people in the chat tonight. All right, so um, no, Doctor Rabbit Hole. No one, no ships can use offensive modules while cloaked. That would be insane. But the Falcon is an ECM ship that can fit and use a covert ops cloak, which means it can warp cloaked. Uh, so the next thing we want to look at is missile guidance. So uh, like, let's say you're in a crucifier, right? And someone tells you, well, we're going to go fight enemy missile ships. So I want you to, to fit missile guidance disruptors. So you essentially just swap, swap over to missile guidance disruptors. Um, Sorry, they're just called guidance disruptors. So we'll use the same ones, right? We'll use scoped. So we just find our scoped guidance disruptor. They're named with a bunch of random shit because people like lore. They have the same fitting requirements. And you don't have to change out anything else on the ships other than the guidance disruptors themselves and the scripts. The scripts are uh, missile uh explosion radius and explosion velocity those are the two statistics that affect how a missile applies damage they're essentially um like the for guns it's uh essentially tracking and range you know your your signature radius and stuff does come into it um but on missiles it's explosion velocity and explosion radius so let's see, let's take um, one of the better applying missile ships. That means uh, that it, it uh, has very fast explosion velocity, which means going moving quickly doesn't reduce the missile damage by very much, and it has a very small explosion radius, which means that being in a smaller ship doesn't uh, mitigate the damage very much. And we'll see what we can do with our little MBI crucifier. Uh, Megamo, if you were posting actual anything in chat, just get in touch with me so I can unban you. But random links tend to be uh, bad stuff. So, uh, so we'll go to our guidance disruptors, and we'll change the charge to missile. Let's go with um, 
uh, we can go with missile range disruption scripts, right? So these are going to reduce the missile's range. Uh, they do this by reducing the missile's speed and the missile's flight time. And we can see in our little uh, our little um, column here, right? The percent that we're reducing these numbers by. Uh, the thing about missiles is because there are four variables that the guidance disruptors can affect, each script does um, two variables each. So the range disruption script reduces the missile velocity and its flight time uh, by the amount you know, of the effectiveness of the module, and then the other script reduces explosion velocity uh, and explosion radius. So we'll just test, you know, what does this do to, to something like a caracal? So we'll go back here to the caracal. You can see that by default, the missiles go 83.7 kilometers. There's a little more to it than that, but I don't want to get in the missile range discussion right now. And we put our crucifier on there. So a single crucifier reduces the missile range to 16.2 kilometers when we put it into the little projected area on PIFA. Um, so, you know, you can just do this, right? You can you can reduce their, their missile range. Now, it's not to say, though, that in certain situations, um, you know, if the caracals are tanking or um, doing enough damage that they're going to win the fight quickly, they may be totally fine with just getting on you at zero, which means that, you know, dampening their targeting range or reducing their missile range doesn't really make a difference. If they're okay with sitting on you at zero kilometers, excuse me, then it won't really make a huge difference. So that's when you might use the other script. We can train, we can uh, change to that. So we'll change to our missile precision disruption scripts. And we'll go back to our caracal. And again, this is where, you know, uh, you can see these numbers, right? These numbers here under the sort of uh, all catch all effects column is showing this 30 meters, 255 meters. That's the explosion radius and explosion velocity. Basically, what it means is that if you are if you are um, smaller than 30 meters in terms of your signature, or if you're faster than 255 meters per second in terms of your speed, then uh, you can mitigate some of this damage. Uh, and when we turn this on, when we turn on our crucifier projection here, you can see those numbers go up. It goes up to 66.8 meters for the uh, explosion radius. The, the bigger this number is, the um, more damage you can mitigate by being small. And then the explosion velocity goes down to 83.5 meters per second. And the lower this number is, the more damage you can mitigate by being fast. But that doesn't really tell us anything, does it? It doesn't show us, uh, you know, it doesn't show us an actual effect. So this is where we can use the graphs again. So if we open up our graph with the caracal, you can see we'll just set this out, like I said, to 200. That's the easiest thing to do. We'll say 90 degrees. This angle actually makes no difference when you're talking about missiles. And you can see the graph looks like against sort of the infinite target. You do your full DPS until you have no range, uh, and then you do no DPS, right? This is this this um, line is a little bit diagonal because of the missile range shenanigans that I sort of mentioned before, but it's a detailed topic for another day. But suffice to say, with missiles, you do all of your damage until you're outside of your range, and then you do no damage. Now let's take, um, what's a good example? Maybe a confessor? I have a confessor fit here. Yeah, there we go. So, oh, this is an inquisitor. How about an actual confessor? There we go. All right, so this is a somewhat standard confessor, right? And a confessor is a ship that um, a caracal is very good at killing if there is nothing else involved because uh, the confessor's usual way to mitigate damage is by being small and fast. Uh, and But the, the rapid light missile caracal applies very well to small, fast targets. So if we put the confessor's default, I just want to make sure no links or anything. 
the default signature radius on the confessor. It's in defense mode, so this is kind of what you would normally expect. It is 43.3, and the velocity is 505. So you can see already the confessor mitigates uh, a bunch of this damage just by it's sort of the nature of it. But let's put it into let's put it into sharpshooter mode. So the signature is a little bit bigger. We'll just make our um, thing a little bit more easy to see the difference. So you can see that it's still taking, you know, not all the damage, but a fair a fair amount of the damage. Uh, and since it's a destroyer, I mean, it's got a decent amount of EHP, um, but it's not. It doesn't have a huge amount of buffer. But if we were to take our Caracal here. Oh, okay. So I had left it on by accident. All right. So if the if the cruiser if the confessor is in uh, sharpshooter mode, then the caracal does basically 100% of its DPS, right? And if you turn the crucifier's projected effects on, it loses two thirds of that DPS. If the confessor is in defense mode, which it usually is. It signature shrinks down to 43.3. And the caracal, you know, does almost still almost its full DPS, but with the crucifier turned on, it falls down to under 90 DPS. And this is an unlinked confessor, and and uh, so the numbers would pretty much just get worse. As long as once you move below the explosion radius or above the explosion velocity you continue to to mitigate more and more damage as you go so if the confessor had links that were causing it to move a little faster or have a smaller signature radius it would be mitigating even more damage so you're essentially like moving the bar at which you start to mitigate damage uh, by disrupting this caracal's missiles you're moving that bar uh, a little bit lower and making it easier for you know whoever he's shooting to mitigate the damage. And I think that's pretty much everything for weapon disruption. It can get a little complicated, but the key is to know, you know, if the enemy is using light missiles, you know, are you better off to messing with their range or their application, depending on your ship or not. And you can always ask the FC. Uh, what if the confessor is in propulsion mode? Well, we can check our confessor. We can change it to prop mode, and we can look at its speed then. It's going 672, and its signature is 65. So uh, the caracal, you know, it's you're basically making a trade-off, right? You're giving, you're increasing the signature of the confessor a little bit, but you're increasing the speed a little bit, so. You, taking about the same amount of damage. Um, the thing about the defensive mode is it doesn't matter how fast it doesn't matter how fast you're moving your signature is always the same whereas with this with the speed mode if you're not actually burning in a straight line at your maximum potential speed you'll mitigate less damage so it's better usually to be in defense mode if you're trying to like um, if you're trying to mitigate damage if that makes sense. All right, does anyone have questions on the crucifier or weapon disruption or anything else that we've talked about so far? All right, so we're on the home stretch. The last two to talk about are the Vigil and then the Griffin. We'll do the Vigil first because it's simple and it's uh, the third best, uh, most effective in a fleet, like in a large, you know, normal large horde fleet. So we'll get our Vigil. Then we've got our fit here. And target painters are what the Vigil is uh, bonused for. They don't require any scripts. Uh, you generally just use them on the enemy primary. 
uh, they're kind of set it and forget it. The uh, ship will also come with a sensor booster and that will increase your targeting range so that you can target dudes from further away. Um, and what target painters do is they just increase the signature radius of the ship that you put them on, which generally speaking makes them easier to hit. Uh, makes missiles apply more damage if they aren't currently applying their max damage. It makes guns easier to track. Uh, and yeah, so this is another situation where you can, you know, project this onto a ship. Like there's a specific ship I want to show here. Uh, all right, so this is the Vexer Navy issues uh, that the goons were using against us the other night. Uh, I'm just going to remove these drones because it's distracting me that it has more drones in the thingy than actually fit in it. There we go. Okay. Uh, so, let's say we wanted to use our Tempest to shoot at this Vexor Navy issue. Um, we'll leave links on here because I think it will show a little better. Actually, eh, we'll turn them off and we'll see. So it's the Vexor Navy issue with no links. Uh, it is going 1700 and it has a signature of 589. So we go to our Tempest and we open our graph. Set it zero to 200, we'll say 90 degrees as the worst case scenario. We will set the velocity to 1703 and the signature radius to 589. So you can see uh, that, you know, of the potential, of the Tempest potential 454 DPS, it's only applying a little over a hundred of it, which means, you know, the volley is gonna be about a quarter as well. Um, but then what we can do is we can go to our go to the VNI here. We can get our vigil fit. We can drag that vigil fit into. Oh, actually, there's already stuff in here. <laughs> All right. So uh, this actually this number is wrong. So we'll go 208 because this is what the number should actually be. So essentially, by default, you apply almost no DPS to this VNI with the Tempest, right? Even if you yeah, you have tracking speed scripts and everything, uh, and you apply almost nothing. You could try, you know, like, what is, how does it change if we go to uh, an ammo that tracks better? Okay, we get a little bit of damage out at, like, 100 kilometers. But we're still not doing so great. Try changing our tracking computers to optimal range. Does that? No, that doesn't help us. It means we can do more damage further out, but less damage um, in terms of, you know, best case scenario. So... Uh, then we can go over to our VNI. We can say one vigil, right? That increases the signature to 403. So we just put that new number in, 403. And oh, okay. Well, now we're doing like 100 DPS as opposed to whatever what it was 14. I think it was, yeah. So it was 208. So yeah, 25 DPS. One one vigil, one T1 frigate shoots the thing with its target painters, and now we're doing 100 DPS. And if we add, oops, let's uh, go here. Let's add another one. Oh, we had to change this. Change it to two vigils. So that means the signature of the VNI is 557. So we can increase that, 557. Oh, look at that. Now we're doing almost 150 DPS. So this is, this is how you can kind of see in a theoretical situation how those vigils actually improve the damage of the other ships in the fleet that are shooting at the same target as it. Uh, and that's basically, you know, why you want target painters, right? To show you a, a practical effect that a target painter can have in a situation. Now, obviously, there's multiple variables. Uh, usually, you'll want... The FC will be saying, you know, I need vigils or et cetera, et cetera, depending on the situation. But that's sort of, um, that's what a target painter does. That's what vigils are good for. Uh, so any questions?
Uh, and as far as e-war with drones, I know you can jam drones. The last thing I heard was that other e-war doesn't work on drones, but I could be wrong on that. I'm not sure. You rarely, if ever, want to apply e-war to drones except fighters, and for fighters you usually want to jam them. All right, so the last thing we have is the griffin. So we'll get a griffin. I think I want to pull the fit from in game. So we actually don't even need anything else because the griffin is very simple. So this is our griffin fit. Uh, you can see we have a micro warp drive to move around, three jammers, a medium shield extender to give you a little bit more tank, a damage control to give you a little bit more tank, a micro auxiliary power core which gives you some more power grid on your fitting so that the, you can get this shield extender, and then the rigs are just uh, increasing the range uh, that you're able to jam optimally at and uh, your targeting range. So jams have a an optimal and a fall off like most of the other uh, eWare does. You know, it provides its most effect up to its optimal, and then as it reaches, as it approaches fall off, it loses effect and so on. Uh, the thing about jams, and the reason why we don't ask for them in large fleets, and you normally don't see large e war wings in large fleets, is that it's a it's a die roll, right? When you try to jam someone, it takes into account your jam strength and their sensor strength, and it does a, a calculation to what percent chance you have to jam them, and then it rolls the dice. And if you roll good, you jam them. If you roll bad, you don't. Uh, all the other e-war works in terms of, it says, are you, you know, where are you at in your optimal and fall off range? Um, and then it just applies the effect. There are certain, um, there are certain ways that certain chips can have e-war resistance. Uh, but in general, when you damp someone or you disrupt them with tracking or missile or guidance disruptors, it just works based on the range that you're at and the skills that you have. It just works. Whereas ECM, you're always rolling the dice. Uh, not to mention ECM also suffers from something that the Crucifier does in that uh, you'll want a different fit depending on what you're fighting. Uh, but instead of just there being two, two options, there are four because there's one for each race of ship. Uh, you'll want to use whatever the color of jam it is that you're going up against in terms of red for Mimitar, yellow for Amor, green for Galente, or blue for Kaldari. Uh, and yeah, so ECM is fun, right? Because you know that when you when you hit a jam, they can't do anything. They can't lock any targets or anything like that. The issue is, um, you know, when you compare it to something like making their optimal range on a Ferox 5 kilometers, or um, making the targeting range 10 kilometers, those are essentially the same thing. You're essentially making the ship not able to do anything, because if it's targeting or optimal range is so low that it can't even apply to targets, you're, it's essentially jammed. The only difference is that with those modules, those work every time, uh, and the ECM works on a, on a random chance. So that's why most uh, experienced FCs will not prefer you to be in e-warships. Um, but e-war is very good for small gang. Um, it's, it's very funny uh, in solo or small gang as well because people get really mad about it. Um, but yeah, that's why generally on fleets we don't ask for griffins. Right, does anyone have any questions on that? Can ECM have a large effect on any logi? It certainly can. Um, the reason why you'll have like ECM drones be a big thing is because there are so many dice rolls spread out across so many drones 
that you're bound to get some successes and it's really hard to you know shoot and destroy all of those drones whereas if you have like a single blackbird the enemy will just shoot it um, and ECM's optimal range tends to be much shorter than the other E-War types um, but if you jam out enemy logic it can be very good yeah um, but a lot of the times you can fuck with the enemy logic in the same way with sensor dampeners um, and uh, and it will work every time. The other reason that ECM drones are used uh, on enemies instead of the other E-War drones is that so because all the other E-War applies 100% of the time and there's no you know dice roll to see if it works or not they will always suffer stacking penalties so you will always get a um, you will always get a reduction in the effectiveness of each additional drone whereas ECM drones since ECM you know once it applies there's no point to a second jam so it doesn't suffer from stacking penalties which means that every single drone is getting the, the same effect um, whereas if you had like web drones for instance or like newt drones or whatever else each additional one would uh, would be less effective than the, the one before it. ECM drones are versus all types, right? Yeah, it's uh, they're multispectral. That's the other thing is that you don't have to worry about which ECM drones to bring. You just bring the ECM drones, and then the law of large numbers mean that you'll you'll jam some stuff, and you don't have to give up any fitting in order to do it, uh, especially on ships where drones are a small portion of their damage. You know, like the three the three drones on a MOA aren't really a significant portion of its damage, so changing those to ECM is actually a, a higher effect than adding whatever 20 DPS. All right, does anyone have any other questions about ECM? Yeah, what's probably the best ECM against drone boats. Um, well, I mean, it depends on what you're trying to do, right? But usually whatever the race uh, of the drone ship. Now, if you're talking about an enemy fleet of drone boats, if you want to use jams on those, it's going to be difficult because anyone who's jammed can just assign their drones to someone else. Uh, if they're set up already in a way where they have their drones assigned to like a drone bunny or a trigger ship, you can jam that one. Um, but then they can always just they can always just say like, okay, well this ship is the trigger instead, or this ship is the trigger instead, or you know everyone just assign your drones manually. So ECM is not not quite so good. Um, you can jam the drones, but usually there's so many of them that that's not a good idea either. So instead of jamming, what about like target disruption? What would be okay. like the best? So what would be the best E-War to use against drone ships? Um, yeah. that, usually that's going to be damps. Um, most drone compositions rely on the trigger ships to have a larger lock radius. Um, so basically your drones can go as far as your drone control range is, regardless of whether you can lock the target they're attacking. The only reason you would need to lock the target they're attacking would be so that you can send them to attack that target. But if you assign them to another ship instead, then only that ship needs to lock out that far. So usually drone compositions, um, the select few ships that the drones are assigned to will have really long targeting range. Uh, so if you damp out those ships, that means they have to use a, 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 another ship with a, like a shorter targeting range as the trigger ship. And that means they have to come closer to you to actually target you and send the drones. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, but most, a lot of drone comps also are uh, what we call overpropped, where they'll have like a an afterburner from the ship class one larger than them, uh, rather than like of of the normal size. So they'll go really fast compared to their signature radius, uh, like with those VNIs that we were looking at. And target painters are really important to help you be able to shoot those without missing. So you always want a, a few target painters, um, but then for sort of offensive e-war against those kind of compositions, stamps tend to be the best. I have one last question. Sure. 
Uh, for like quick fleets that allow tackle and you war without specific requirements, which you war types do you usually go? I would usually go with a with damps, with a mollus or you know whatever because, like I was saying, um, they apply in every situation, whereas the others can be fairly situational. Some fleets target painters like if you're in a fleet and your DPS is already applying its damage perfectly, a target painter does literally nothing. Um, if you're in a fleet where the enemy is using drones, tracking disruption and guidance disruption does nothing. If you're in a fleet where the enemy is using missiles, tracking disruptors don't work, and vice versa, but uh, sensor dampeners always work. Excellent, thank you. Mm -hmm. Someone says, when you don't know what the enemy forms, best setup would be damps greater than tracking, greater than point, greater than ECM. Yeah, I would say um, target painters aren't necessarily in that hierarchy because you only need a few of them for max effectiveness and only in certain situations, but anytime they are called for, they're really useful. But I would say, yeah, damps most of all because they're so flexible and, and then weapon disruption after that, because the ship itself is very powerful. You just need to, you need to pick the right disruption to bring, whether it's missile or gun. Uh, and then below that would be ECM. Yeah. All right, any other questions about uh, this stuff? Uh, any questions about anything Eve related that's on your mind? <laughs> Mayonnaise is not an instrument. All right, well, that wraps it up then. Um, so yeah, make sure you have Pypha. Make sure you play around with it. Uh, make sure that you, uh, you know, pretty much any fleet ever, we will accept E-War frigates into. Um, so if you're worried about what you should fly and you're a new player, just always feel free to hop in a, an E-War frigate and, you know, damp out the enemy, disrupt, tracking disrupt the enemy, you know, do all sorts of stuff. And uh, and yeah, you're you're in a ship that we you know we hand out the E War frigates for free, and that they can be very very effective. You know, you can remove anywhere from one to three of the enemy ships essentially from the fight just by using your little uh, your little dinky T one frigate. So thanks for coming, guys. If you missed this, uh, you can check my Twitch vod, or I'll have it uploaded to YouTube in a, a bit. And uh, and yeah. Make sure you guys go in the strat up in uh, 40 minutes. And I will see you there. Thank you. All right, guys. Ooh. Uh, I am leaving comms now. Or I'll just defend myself. Uh, so yeah, thanks for coming, guys. Uh, hope you learned some stuff. Uh, hope you had fun. So we ran a little long, but I tend I do go on. Um, so I'm going to be trying to do more stuff like this. Um, you know, with various different things. Um, it'll be more fun when we can go over like you know, a fleet doctrine and then take that fleet out for spin. Um, but I've been trying to find the time to do it where we don't have like horde strat ops and shit and it's just been real busy lately. So we'll keep trying. Um, but yeah, thanks for coming. Um, I've actually got to run, so no song today. Very sad. And, uh, and yeah, if you have more ideas for classes and whatnot, just join my discord. You can go to discord.averin.net. Uh, I bought a domain. Um, and join the discord you just go there in your browser it'll it'll pop you right in um, and yeah if you want to tune into the stream anytime you guys can now you can just go to avarin.net rather than type typing in twitch and all that shit um, but yeah hop on the discord and give me send me a pm or um, in general chat or whatever and just let me know you know what kind of stuff you're looking to uh, to learn about and 
yeah, we'll do some more classes and all that good stuff. So thank you guys for coming. Uh, as I always say, be safe, be kind, love each other. We'll see you next time. So long.